Hey everybody, and welcome to the Blizzard Watch podcast. I'm Matt. I'm the host. With me this week are my two fantastic co-hosts, Liz Harper and Joe Perez. Hi to you guys, and you guys can say hi to them now. Hello. Hey. Welcome, friends, old and new. Yeah. Uh, it's it's actually been a really surprisingly busy week since the last podcast. Um, I, I wasn't expecting this much news this fast. Uh, so we're going to just jump into it and get as much of it down the way as we can, so we can talk about other things. Um, first up. I'm going to talk about patch 9.1.5. I th- didn't think I would be talking about it again because we kind of already talked about it last week and I thought that was going to be it. But then they, re- I think it was Friday, they revealed that they're going to be doing the PTR for it this week. And then they talked about a lot of stuff that's going to be on it. One of the things that I wanted to talk the most about is that they're making some transmog changes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm yeah. shocked that this is what we're talking about. The the, the first and most important transmog change is, is simply a change to the legacy loot system. Uh, all of Battle for Azeroth's raids are going on legacy loot. I, this is partially because, let's face it, uh, by the time we're done with patch 9.1, we are going to be geared well enough that we can blow up a good chunk of, of Battle for Azeroth content, and they want people to be able to go in and do transmog hunting. So that's one change that I really liked. Uh, the other change is basically related to covenants and conduits and all that stuff, in that you're going to be able to change your covenant a lot more easily in patch 9.1.5. And as a result, any transmog appearances you unlock while you're in a covenant will remain with you when you switch to a different covenant. So now, if you are, say, some kind of person who is a nut who loves to do transmog all the time, <laughs> and you don't have a ton of alts to get all the appearances, you can just switch covenants to get them. And there's no penalty to it at all. You just do it. Well, you have to be, I think they said max. max there's a certain renown. amount of renown. Yeah. yeah, you have to be max yeah. renown, but once you're at max renown, you can just switch whenever and you want to. the other thing is your alts have access to all those trans monks as well, no matter mm-hmm. what covenant they're in. Yep. And so I'm sitting here going, okay, the most efficient way for me to do this is to simply get my main up to max renown and then flip through the various covenants until I've done all four on one character. Um, so yeah, I am I am currently working on a, a spreadsheet about this in point of fact. So so yeah, those changes were nice. Um, we did a post on the site recently about like oh, you know other you things they could do. Skip them all too. Don't forget about that. Oh no, I'm not forgetting about it. I, we just we're still talking about transmog, but yeah. And why don't you talk about it since you brought it up? I was just going to say, like, they're adding the ability to skip the mall intro, which, yeah, that's great, because I can't tell you how many times I've started an alt, gone to the mall, and just like, I, 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 I don't want to do this. I get to the first game, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I'll come back to you maybe later. Like, maybe, if you're lucky. This has definitely been, like, the top most requested change I've heard about people, about the game, ever since people did the mall for the first time. They're just like, okay, can I skip this now? No? Can yeah. I skip this now? How about now? See, the thing about the Maw is I think it's it's extremely well done. It's it is. It's really good content, but yeah. it is also it's it's sort of like the back in, in Legion when you did the the first time you went through the whole storyline with, with Varian and Sylvanas Broken Shore thing. First time was really cool, but then it, it has diminishing returns on how cool it is once you've seen it. Yeah, and then you start don't, really realizing like how long it is, and like, and it's yeah. not a bad thing. It's a great first experience, and like, it's something to revisit later. But like, yeah, especially with how people like we we level alt sometimes. Yeah, I, I play for twenty minutes, and then I got to go do something else, and I'm <laughs> still in the middle of the maw. I log out to go do the other thing I have to do, and then I come back, and it's three in the morning, and I'm like, I only got an hour before I'm going to pass out, and I'm still going to be in the maw for that time. Okay, I'll go play some other character. I'll play one of the ones I got through this already. So yeah, I think that's a really good change. I think any change that makes alt leveling easier, this expansion is going to be a good move. Yeah, uh, I agree. But one of the other things I wanted to talk about, but I'm hoping uh, Liz or Joe will talk about it because my thirsty. <laughs> um, patch 9.1.5 is also going to let you move anima between characters. Yeah, you can already move soul ash between characters, right? Like I think that's already a thing you can right. do. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so you can do that in Corthia. Yeah, so you can do that as in Corthia, but like now the the fact that you're going to be able to do some some transferring of anima uh, to alts makes things a lot better and a lot easier, especially for like I have felt this trying to get my hunter up to speed. Like farming mm-hmm. anima while they've made it better is is kind of crushing, but I have all of this anima on uh, loader that like I'm just not using for anything. And it's just sitting there doing nothing. And now they're giving me a way that I can go, 
here, give it to your alts and do stuff. So, Liz, what do you think? Uh, yeah, for sure. The other thing they've done is they've already, they hot fixed this in today, I think. Uh, they removed the, well, they significantly increased the anima cap. It used to be a maximum of 3,500 anima you could just carry around. Now it's 200,000. So we actually had people who were hitting that cap, and then you're just, you're filling your bags with these anima items that you can't do anything with. Uh, so now you'll be able to collect anima freely and send it off freely. To quote my guild, so Spiders of Doe is an outlier. <laughs> 200,000 cap, wow. Ugh. Yeah. So that's going to make it a lot easier to just manage anima. And the, okay, one more anima thing. They will be adding a thing in Corthia where you can turn in your anima tokens from Corthia without going back to your Covenant Sanctum. So they're adding a bunch of little things that's that are going to streamline. Of life. Yeah. Yeah. That are going to just streamline this whole anima gathering process, which has been such a headache all expansion. There, and there was one other thing I wanted to say just about patch 9.1.5 as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I've been seeing a lot of people claiming that like this is like a reaction of them trying to bury everything that's been happening over the last couple weeks. I think those people are grossly underestimating how long stuff like this takes to work on plan and get into production. And the fact that it's hitting the BT PTR is not an insignificant thing. That means that they've been working on this for a while. So, like, if you are one of those people, I'm, I hate to break it to you, but, like, these are not insignificant changes. These are not things that are, like, light switches that they can just flip on and off at the, at the whim. This is stuff that they've been gathering feedback and listening to since, you know, release and figuring out how they're going to address it. And also, traditionally, the .5 patches are this kind of patch, too, right? Like, we're seeing huge quality of life improvements. We're seeing tweaks to systems. And that's generally what they do in the .5 patches between major content drops. So, like, this is right on par. This is what I honestly started expecting from a a .5 patch. This is more than I expected. I didn't realize that they had been working on nearly any of this stuff. But it is fantastic. Like, I'm super uh, pumped. To, to piggyback then, since I think this is a good place to mention this last thing from 9.1.5 I wanted to mention. Um, time walking is coming with patch 1. You know, 9.1.5. Uh, it's Legion time walking. And it, it, I think, I'm pretty sure this is a first. They will be bringing Legion's Mythic Plus dungeons into time walking. You will mm -hmm. be able to run Mythic Plus Legion dungeons as current content in patch 9.1.5 and it'll be for two weeks the first time we get the legion time walking it's going to last for two weeks not just a week and then when it goes into the rotation every time legion comes up there'll be a week where you can run the mythic plus in their in their mythic plus dungeons the assumption here i have here is that the battle for azeroth ones will eventually get added to the rotation as well this is fantastic um, it's fantastic but it is not easy to do no um, this is not an undertaking that they could go, oh, we're getting bad press. We're getting really bad press. We'd better, you know, hit the button that says Legion time walking dungeons. I mean, it's just not something that happens. They cannot roll out time walking just to save their butts on PR. Not that it's working anyway, but it would, it's just not feasible. Um, I think people forget that the people and the, the wow dev team right now are mostly made up of people who are the ones trying to get things to change for the better they're the mm -hmm. people who you know are going through this they're not the people doing it the people running the company are different story um so i do think that that's something you have to keep in mind uh it just it isn't it is not reasonable to expect something on just just the time walking change is like months of work months of work at the minimum uh, more like we've been working on this since we started Shadowlands and, and finally have it ready sort of work. And so, yeah, a lot of stuff is coming out now. A lot of changes are coming out now. That doesn't mean that they, they have the ability to drop all this stuff whenever it, they don't have a, a, you know, a button that they can push or a big break glass in case of PR emergency <laughs> to pull out, you know, I wish I had change. one of those buttons now. Thanks Ross. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <sighs> but anyway, at this point we come to the part of our, our news roundup where Joe and I can sit back and know almost nothing <laughs> because it's the hearthstone part. Uh, I do. I am going to actually intro this though. Cause I did know a little something. I did know that okay. hearthstone did its, I knew that hearthstone was doing its big reveal today mm -hmm. and that they did. One of the things they revealed is the mercenary mode that they've been talking about for like a year um, and not telling us we, we knew practically nothing about this, which would have been the case for me anyway, but we didn't, we still didn't actually know that this was going, what, what it entails. We knew that it existed. We knew that they were working on it. Now we finally have a reveal of it, which I have not seen. 
So I still don't know anything, but I did know that I don't know anything. And that's important. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the first step to learning is knowing yes. what you don't know or knowing that you don't know something. Um, so yeah, the Blizzard has been teasing this, um, this mercenary mode for a while. And I remember when we first saw previews of it with preview art and all of that, and they were talking about it. It's like everyone walked away and said, oh, it's a Hearthstone game, like Slay the Spire. And then Blizzard was immediate, like, was immediately saying, oh, no, not like that. And that was kind of the last we heard, <laughs> is that we'd just been d shown this game that sounded a lot like uh, Slay the Spire. And Blizzard said, oh, no, that's not what we really meant, but we aren't going to tell you what we really meant. And it's kind of been this nebulous thing for a while. And um, there's still a lot we don't know, but we, we know more. <laughs> yeah, I, and, I do. Some of the memes for this have been fascinating there like was one i saw it was like do you, are you confused after that mercenaries reveal well fear not yeah. here's a 15 second breakdown and it was just gobbledygook from a, like a, a cartoon it was like what is going on so i was like yeah well, um i think the problem is not so much that it's confusing it's that like by calling it hearthstone i think that almost makes it harder to explain because this is not hearthstone this bears almost no similarity to Hearthstone. There are no cards. There are no decks. This is not Hearthstone. We've, we've flown away from what we've previously known as Hearthstone. This is basically, it's, an, it's a tactical RPG that kind of uses a Hearthstone framework. So you have kind of, so you're recruiting these mercenaries and the mercenaries have art like Hearthstone card art, but they aren't Hearthstone cards. And uh, you recruit these mercenaries, you send them through these missions, and they get experience, they collect gear, you can level them up, you can level up their abilities, you can uh, it's level Shadow up their Legends, gear. It? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's really, it's just a, it's a little tactical RPG built into a Hearthstone framework. And we're going to see all sorts of, like, kind of cool, iconic characters that can be our new mercenary team. And we're going to send them on these bounty missions that go through something. This is a lot like Slay the Spire, where you kind of pick, it's a randomized kind of dungeon sort of crawl, where you pick, okay, I'm going to go into this room over here. I'm going to go into that room over there. And you can run into random different scenarios in each room. Maybe it's a normal fight. Maybe it's a fight against a tough, epic boss mob. Maybe you'll run into a spirit healer who will resurrect companions you had that have died while you fought your way here. Um, so it's the mission table the it's, game. It kind of is, but it's, you know, it's advanced it's with more. on that. Yeah, yeah, with more. You're, you're collecting all these different mercenaries, you're leveling each one of them up, you're gearing them all up. They have all sorts of different abilities that they get at different levels. And um, in the actual combat, it's a little more like Hearthstone. It's kind of like Hearthstone Battlegrounds, where you kind of set up the board and then you let it play out. Uh, but it's really, this is almost nothing like Hearthstone, and putting it inside Hearthstone actually makes it a little confusing because it's. So you put an auto battler with with um, basically importing like a lot of mechanics from a lot of different kinds of games into yeah. a Hearthstone platform, but taking out anything that might remind you of Hearthstone in the process. I mean. The, the big parts of it that are Hearthstone is the art style and just all of that. But it, it, this is not a card game anymore. We've just, this is just a little, a little RPG game and it sounds really fun to me. Uh, but there's, uh, I, yeah, I think it's really confusing mostly because it's just so different. And it's hard to explain that. And in today's demo, they talked a lot about all these different mechanics, but they did not show us like a full match from beginning to end. They showed little clips of gameplay, and then they explained this is happening and this is happening and this works this way. And But they didn't show us like a full gameplay all the way through. So it's kind of hard to fit those pieces together and know, you know exactly what it will be like. You know what this reminds me of? Hmm. Remember when they were going to make like a cool little StarCraft mod? That, that allowed you to do various combat things. And then they decided, why don't we make Blizzard All-Stars? And then it became... So, yeah, it, it, be suddenly, it feels like they've, they've done... They were gun-shy about actually saying, oh, no, we've made another game. We're going to have to call it another game. And so they made sure to put it inside Hearthstone, even though it is practically another game, because I, that way it's still 
branded as Hearthstone. It just feels weird, weird that it's an auto battler in Hearthstone. I would have expected them. Like, it would have been. It would have felt less weird oh. if this would have been like, here's here's Heroes of the Storm. Here's another thing we're just adding to that framework. Like I would have expected oh. that, but this not so much. I mean, Hearthstone already has an auto battler called Battlegrounds, which is really great and really fun. And Battlegrounds was exactly what I thought of when Blizzard explained that Shadowlands was going to have a mission table that was going to be like an auto battler. And I thought, oh, it's going to be like Hearthstone Battlegrounds. That's going to be so cool. It's so fast paced huh. and fun. And then they did what we have, which is slow and offers no feedback and is confusing. And who knows if you're going to win or lose or, you know, it's. It's a game where the points are made up and none of it matters. So <laughs> needs more so now, if, if it, Yeah, I was gonna say if <laughs> if if we actually had Colin Mockery, or as I like to call him, vicious mockery, <laughs> uh, vicious mockery popping out, then that would be one thing. But yeah, this is fascinating to me that, that this has happened. But I, I know oh. that they did they they did other stuff because you wrote a whole list of yeah. things they did. So. <laughs> Let's let's go through the other things they did before we move on to some emails. One more thing with the mercenary mode that makes it particularly interesting is that it will have characters from outside of Hearthstone. There is going to be a Diablo mercenary with little kind of sorted figures around him. And you can pre-order Diablo right now and get your own special Diablo mercenary. Which Diablo are you pre-ordering? Diablo 2? Uh, no, no, it's this is completely inside Hearthstone. You can pre-order a Diablo Mercenary pack, and you'll get the Diablo Mercenary and lots of. So you know, they're bringing stuff. in other Blizzard yes. franchises to this. Yes. So, so it is so, Heroes of the Storm. I I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Um. Okay. Moving on from Mercenaries for real this time. The other thing they're doing is they have a new mount reward for World of Warcraft, which is uh. The little mouse from that cool Hearthstone trailer. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes, Maybe. we know about you talking about the, the Hearthstone trailer with the mouse. Believe yes, me, the I've, mouse. I've heard about it. It's the mouse. So Sarge, right? Little... His name is Sarge, I think. That's it. I just totally blanked on his name. I think it is Sarge. I don't play Hearthstone, um, but I know th- I know who Sarge is. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's like it's a cute little mouse that you can ride around. And to get it, you will have to play through the introduction for mercenaries mode in Hearthstone, which is completely free. You should be able to pay it, play it without paying anything, but they're really encouraging you to get in and try these other games. And the other thing is a new six month subscriber reward in uh, for a six month WoW subscription, but it gives you rewards in Hearthstone. And it's actually, a sounds lot like a of battle rewards, pass. doesn't it? It's a lot of Hearthstone rewards. It will give you, I think we did the math earlier, and it would be like uh, like $120 worth of stuff in Hearthstone because you get a Tavern Pass and uh, a, a Battlegrounds Pass for both the present expansion and the next expansion. You get 15 card packs for this expansion, 15 card packs for the next expansion, and uh, you get a bunch of mercenary packs, which is where you get like you get mercenary coins and mercenaries out of these different packs. So you get 30 of those. And, you know, if you bought each of these things in the Hearthstone store, you're going to spend over 100 bucks. So if you play Hearthstone and you play World of Warcraft, like I happen to, this is actually like an incredible deal. This is like a really good deal. And if you don't play Hearthstone... Well, this is a certainly a way to encourage WoW players to jump in Hearthstone or encourage Hearthstone players to get a WoW subscription because it's a really good deal, even if you don't play WoW at all. So mm, I'm wondering, it's, is it's a twenty dollars savings? Precursor? Isn't it? Yeah, it's a good savings, really. Well, I was gonna say, so it's, is it's, this a precursor to like, like you said, a battle pass that's for multiple Blizzard games? I mean, it would make sense, and I feel like that's something they've been trying to work towards for a long time, because I, I know it's not the first time that that's been even mentioned, and I, that's sort of like well, a big thing I mean, going on back the other here, side of their house, right? Like, yeah, activism. going back here, though, um, I remember when I got a year subscription to World of Warcraft, and I got Diablo 3. Yeah, same. Yeah. I, did not, I didn't spend a cent on Diablo 3. I bought the expansion when it came out, but I did not buy Diablo 3. I got it free. Because I had I had subbed for a year of WoW. Yeah, same same and thing. Yeah, that's why I was playing it. That's why I played it for so long because it was like, well, you know, okay, it's got some problems on launch, but hey, it's free and it's fun to why play. Not? Yeah, why not keep playing it? So 
that's interesting to me because we know Diablo 4 is coming out. We know that other games are being worked on. So yeah, the this might be the time to roll out if they're going to try and do a, you know, the WoW subscription is now just your Blizzard subscription type idea. This might be the time to roll it out. Although with recent events, you can actually see mm-hmm. why they might not want to roll it out. But, you know, hey, we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, that's actually, wasn't there a Battlegrounds revamp too? I know you haven't played it yet. I think based on the notes yeah, you they, sent. They rolled out a big patch this morning and that kind of completely revamped Battlegrounds, added a few new heroes, totally changed up all the minion setups. I haven't had time to play around with it. But if you play Battlegrounds, go check it out because they're, if you enjoy Battlegrounds, they've just done a bunch there. It'll, it'll be like a whole new game because I went in for one match and it's like, I don't know what any of these minions are anymore. It's all surprising and new and different and exciting. Which is, you know, kind of what you want out of a game. Being yeah. excited and not bored because you've seen this a hundred times before. But enough about Assassin's Creed Valhalla's Siege of Paris <laughs> DLC. Um, I didn't get to complain about that in the pre-show, so I snuck <laughs> it in here like a knife. Um, I think we're going to move on, though, to doing some of those emails and questions we got. Uh, we've got a fair oh. amount of them this week. Uh, but before we do, um, I wanted to f- basically tell you all how to get us in contact with us for uh we didn't talk as much about transmog as i wanted to hmm. Great. It's still um, time. we can we can well, if if we end up getting through the emails and we've got some dead time i'll talk more about transmog because i i have thoughts but anyway um if you have an email for the show you can send it to podcast at blizzardwatch.com with the subject line podcast or blizzard watch so we know it's for this show uh or you can do one of those open-ended ones where you're like i don't care what show it ends up on and then you know of course there's a lot of squabbling but I, I cannot stress this enough. Please let us know if you can that it's for this show because at this point we got three podcasts going, guys, and I love having three podcasts going. I think it's awesome, but it is you know you do kind of like sometimes people send you in stuff that it doesn't say what it's for, and it's hard to tell what, who where you want it to go. So that would be great. Uh, or you can go to our Discord, and we've got two channels on Discord. Uh, the first is the podcast. Uh, it's the patron. Pod Q and podcast questions channel, uh, where we look for podcast questions. I know in Q questions as well. Um, that's you, you can specify in the body of your question what show it's for there, and that's great. Or you can go to the Q questions channel, which is not patron locked because we we do like to give patrons first shot at the various podcasts because that's that's a good way to motivate people to be patrons, and that helps us do these podcasts. But if you're not able to for whatever reason, we have that channel. We look in there as well. Um, but we will. We will absolutely be happy to take questions from there too. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we get these various questions. Uh, you can also send Joe a DM on Twitter because he likes getting those. Uh, I say send Joe that because I don't check my DMs very often. Uh, just tweet uh, at I'm me. Old. Don't don't listen to Matt. Tweet at tweet at me. Don't my DMs are, are not exactly wide open. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, again, I also am very bad at getting tweets at me. I have the time I don't notice them. Uh, but so yeah, you can do that too if you really want to. But I would really suggest Discord or email over that. Anyway, went through all of that. Now we're going to get to the part where we actually read these things. Um, as has been the case lately, we're going to switch between people, and I'm going to throw the first one to Liz. Uh, so Liz, you make me talk about Hearthstone for like 20 minutes, and then you give me this really long question to read. I see what you're doing here. I see how this is working out. Um, okay. I'm very thirsty. Okay. <laughs> 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 this is it. This is the show now, people. Um, so our first question is from Delos. Hello again, observers of Frozen Things. Question this time for the Blizzard Watch podcast, as it has to do w- more with mechanics than lore. I love the time-walking mechanic, but I find myself missing some of the options in there. Utrgard Utre- Pinnacle? Oh, man, I know I'm sa- saying that wrong. Utgard. Ut- Utgard Pinnacle, but no Utgard Keep in wrath t- during Wrath time-walking? Say it ain't so! Blizzard has already developed the technology to scale dungeons as needed, so I don't think it's a matter of technical capacity. I'm not a programmer, so I may be underestimating the work here. But as a quality of life improvement, let's maybe have all the dungeons from an expansion instead of just six of them. Obviously, Mists of Pandaria, with its whopping six Pandaria-specific dungeons, as a huge fan of dungeon runs, that that was disappointing wouldn't see an expansion of available content, but everywhere else would. Similarly, maybe add a vanilla classic dungeons time walking to cover the vanilla area dungeons throughout Kalimdor and the Eastern Kingdoms. 
not the cataclysm specific and new dungeons leave those in cata time locking. That one might have to be broken to vanilla Kalimdor and vanilla Eastern Kingdom sets as separate time locking events, given how many of them there are, but again, feels doable. All of this goes back to both quality of life improvements, increasing availability of older content for fun and enjoyment, and increasing variety of gameplay available to the player base of WoW. Thoughts? Comments? Love it? Hate it? Well, I mean, I don't hate it, but it is you, you are underestimating how much work it's going to be. Because you are always, not you specifically, Delos, literally everybody, including the people on this podcast, are always underestimating how much work it's going to be. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes the people at Blizzard who are doing the work are underestimating how much work it's going to be because you can never know how much work it's going to be till you start doing it and find out, oh, oh my, we, th- there was a great example from BlizzCon, I think a couple years back when WoW Classic was first coming out that they had no idea was going to happen, that all the lamps were the wrong color. And they were like, why is this happening? There's no reason that this should be happening. Why have we plugged this code in and it's the, the lamps are all wrong? Why? And then they found out why. And it was like, this is insane that this is the reason why, but it is the case. And it took them like, I think three months to fix it. <laughs> and that's like just one little thing. You never know. You're asking, like, why can't they just scale up all these dungeons? There could be a dozen reasons why they haven't done it. Yeah, now, uh, would it be good to have it? Absolutely. I was going to say, like, just piggybacking off of what Matt's saying, like, I always use this as my example because I think it's hilarious, but it also drives the point to a perfect, as far as I'm concerned, a perfect end. How many times have you seen over the course of the last few expansions, not necessarily in Shadowlands, but definitely through Battle for Azeroth, where they would update something in the current expansion? And Alduar would break. <laughs> Alduar from Wrath of the Lich King from many, many expansions ago that has nothing to do with the current content, or so you think. The The weird thing about this game, which is sort of like just an artifact of how old it is and how long it's been around, like, and yes, Dan, specifically Alduar. <laughs> uh, Alduar would break in spectacular fashion, and I don't know why it was Alduar. Um... But when they originally built this game, don't forget that they didn't expect it to stick around for more than a couple years, right? <laughs> like, that was the expectation. They flat out said this, and then they had to keep building on this code that wasn't clean. That was whatever we could do to get this to work and get it out the door or to basically bootstrap whatever code to other code to get things functional. And you if you lived through vanilla you 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 knew it like there were dead many days of downtime and all sorts of stuff like that but now move to where we are now and you have almost two decades of code that has been built upon rebuilt scratched scrubbed rebuilt built upon and then piled upon more and more and more and so like when you start looking at things like this like i honestly didn't even realize ukar ukar keep was not in the rotation like, I had to go back and look, but it also makes sense why they would only do a handful of the dungeons and not all of them, because now they have to take that code that is almost like a capsule in time for when it was made and last updated, take it apart, look at it, make sure that it can accept the new content, make sure that it can accept the players, make sure that it can accept the races that didn't exist back then uh, without breaking in spectacular fashion, then scale it. Like, it is a monumental task for one dungeon to be able to accomplish all of that. And so, like, Matt's Matt's absolutely right. Like, I think we all grossly underestimate the amount of work in it. Would it be nice? Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, I'd absolutely love to have that. But I also don't need to hear about Yogg Saron breaking his his tentacle prison chains and breaking free Northrend because they made Ukard keep a time-walking dungeon. Um, And by that, I mean he just doesn't spawn. Right. Yeah. One of the things that I, I definitely want to say is I, I not only do I not hate it, I absolutely think it should be a goal of mm-hmm. time walking mm-hmm. for a particular expansion to have more content in it. I absolutely do think that. And I absolutely would love to see older stuff get released under time walking. Although I'm going to be upfront with you. If they ever did a, a, a classic slash vanilla sunken temple, <laughs> none of you would play it. <laughs> I do not know if people play Sunken Temple on WoW Classic right now. If you do, kudos, because I remember doing a Sunken Temple run that was, no lie or exaggeration, 16 hours long. Yep. 
I'm not bribe people. kidding. Legitimately had to bribe people. People were dropping in and out. I was like, I was getting delirious from hunger at one point. <laughs> so I took a, I took an hour break. I'm like, I'll be back in an hour. If you get somebody, I guess you're going to have to wait. Came back. They still hadn't found somebody. As I was about to drop group, they got somebody. So I had to keep tanking it. That, that reminds this, me of the 48 hour uh, Alteric there. Um, yeah. Uh, Arathi Basin. Ooh. A 48 hour yeah. Arathi Basin that would not end. Yeah, there that happened all the time. That's a reason that they added in stuff to make them end whether or not somebody got to a victory point. Because they would do uh, that. So yeah. so so should there be more content for time walking? Yes. Should they keep bringing in a dungeons that weren't end game dungeons for those particular expansions? Absolutely. Uh, I'd love to see original Scarlet Monastery as oh, a yeah. series of oh, time walking dungeons. I would be totally down for it. But I am not going to tell you that it's you know as you said when you said you're not a programmer you you told us you weren't a programmer without telling us you were a programmer by the question <laughs> because it is the kind of innocent question that somebody like me would have asked uh back when i first got a job at a, at a wow cup website in 2007 <laughs> i would have been the kind of person who be like eh, how hard can it be and then i lived through watching as blizzard made a relatively insignificant change to the code of World of Warcraft and broke orc shoulders for six months. Yeah. <laughs> There's, did you see, orc well, hold on a second. Did you guys, you, you, okay, so do, have you seen the current, like, weird broken thing that is in Shadowlands right now with the Night Fae Hearthstone? No. Orc belt buckles grow to enormous, ridiculous, like, WWF <laughs> wrestling belt size when you use, like, when you use the Hearthstone. Even the current stuff has weird bugs revolving around orcs and armor. Like, yeah, it still happens, orc, folks. Though. Yeah, so, is it a great idea? Yes. Should they do it as as much as they can do it, given the constraints of the situation? But is it easy to do it? Absolutely not. It is not as simple as flipping a switch. I think that's cool. If, if my legacy talking about Blizzard games and video games in general ever has any value, it'll be that idea that you know, this is not as easy as you think it is. Yeah. Um, there's and, a reason that, that you know, um, that, that it takes as long as it does, you know. And, and many and we know that a lot of the people that are working on this content, they, they play it as much as, as we do, if not more, not just from the sheer effort of like working on it, but like they want this stuff, too. And it's just it's always going to be a matter of difficulty time and when they can put it in. Right. So like it, it might happen and it would be really, really nice, but we'll wait, we'll see what happens. Alrighty. Um, so now that you've answered that question and I made Liz talk for a solid five minutes reading it, uh, Joe, you're up. <laughs> and I can see why you let me do this one. Hey, Blizzard Watch crew. I'm Joe. No relation that I know of. Anyway, my question is Diablo, Diablo, Diablo me, Diablo into my veins. Talk about Diablo. <clears throat> anyway, nice to finally send in a question. It's cool that you guys have a really nice Joe in your podcast. Diablo. <laughs> First of all, yeah. thank you very much for saying I'm nice. <laughs> Uh, but Matt, this is your show then, uh, man. Diablo, Diablo. I I don't know what you want me to talk about exactly. Um, do you yeah, if you want a, me? Hmm? It's a pretty broad topic. Yeah. Um, I, I am therefore going to talk about something that I always find really fascinating, and that involves the site to a degree. Back, mm -hmm. I want to say in twenty seventeen, early twenty eighteen, Blizzard licensed a comic book from a guy named Marv Wolfman. Oh, who, if I, you remember if, that. Oh, I remember if you, this. Yeah, if you like comics, you know who Marv is because Marv Wolfman was the big writer on Teen Titans back in the 80s and 90s. He did a lot of stuff for Marvel before coming to DC. He did a lot of stuff for DC. And he was the architect behind Crisis on Infinite Earths, yep. which was the biggest comics crossover of its generation. And basically, with, with Secret Wars, basically spawned the concept of an entire company's comics all dovetailed to this event. And... So hiring Marv Wolfman to write a comic book for you is a big deal. And I don't know how Blizzard thought this was going to go. I don't, I think they thought this would somehow go under the radar. It did not. Mm -hmm. uh, people immediately noticed this. They also noticed the subject matter. Now I'm going to remind you again, this was like 2017 to wasn't, 2018. Wasn't, wasn't uh, Piotr Kowalski also involved in that or something like that? I believe he was the artist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but so the problem was that was the first problem that the names involved were big enough that people noticed. The second problem was that they had leaked a cover art of Lilith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And,
And so this, you know, people kept asking me back in 2019 when I, when I, how I had called a year earlier that Lilith was going to be the main villain of Diablo four. And I kept saying, I, it did not require anything like sleuthing on my part. They published an announcement for a comic book about Lilith in 2017. Uh, that was all I needed. It was, it was literally a giant red flag. Um, w- w- she's right there on the cover art, which you can still find. And I so, literally just linked it in, in work chat. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's, the first thing that that happened. And so um, Liz being a sensible person was like, Hey, you want to write this up? You know, this seems like it may be kind of interesting. And I said, yes, you are correct. It is quite interesting. And so going into BlizzCon 2018, we all expected a Diablo four announcement mm-hmm. yep. because oh, of this comic gosh. book. Oh gosh. And they didn't ever publish the comic. They suddenly were like, Oh, well that's going on hiatus. We're going to reconsider that deal. Because they realized what they had done was basically tell everybody that they were working on Diablo 4 and who the villain was. And so they didn't want to to fuel that any further. But the internet being what it is, it was going to be fueled further because everybody had seen it. You couldn't undo that. Yeah, it was the point of no return. And so I've always thought about this going into BlizzCon 2018. Up until fairly recently, I honestly thought BlizzCon 2018 was the worst PR blunder Blizzard could have. Um, Clearly, they were. Oh, those hell, those halcyon days. Yeah. Um, But 2018 was a perfect example of them not being ready to make an announcement and deciding not to make it, even though they had to. And I'll say that again. They really had to make the announcement, but they decided not to anyway. And that was the mistake. Because it it has dogged Diablo Immortal ever since, to the point where I think Diablo Immortal's only now getting out from under it. I would agree. Yeah, and even, even we were all even there. Myself, like I, I, I even had to go back and apologize. Like my gut reaction at that point, because it was just so opposite of what I was expecting, was terrible. Like it was yeah, bad. and I think all of us having observed the the BlizzCon experience of 2018, we were all working at that time on the yeah. site. I think we all realized, wow, this this feels like a hole. Even if even if they were never prepared going to make the announcement at that BlizzCon, if they were never going to, it didn't matter anymore. Mm-hmm. By publishing a simple announcement about a licensed comic book, they had put themselves in a position where nothing they did was going to be was going to be well received ultimately, but what they chose to do was the worst possible option. And I think they thought that a new Blizzard game about the, in the Diablo franchise would be enough. And had it been something like a console game or something that would be on PC, I think people would have thought it was enough. And they would have still wanted Diablo 4, absolutely. But not only was this game not Diablo 4, was it was basically a prequel, um, but it's a prequel that you can only play on a mobile device. Mm-hmm. And Blizzard's core at the time is, was not heavily mobile oriented still isn't let's be honest let, let me add a note in about this comic because i went and looked it up it was actually expected to publish on november 7th which would have been right there around blizzcon yep. and you could even pre-order it so it's not like this was not like a vaporware there was color preview art available and there were pre-orders mm-hmm. so this went all the way and then at the last minute i don't know yeah, at the last minute they realized, oh God, if we actually have this thing come out in November of this year, well, that's BlizzCon. We're gonna have to make an announcement about Diablo Four. I'll we'll never know what was going on with Diablo Four until like after the game comes out, they might, you know, there might be one of those making of Diablo Four things where someone will say, Oh yeah, we were totally gonna do it, but then this happened. But regardless, whether or not they intended to make an announcement and then couldn't for whatever reason, they couldn't not make the announcement without what happened happening. And it's always been astonishing to me watching that train wreck because uh, first off, Diablo Immortals looks like a good game. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. There's there's nothing wrong with that game. There's it, it should never have had to endure what it had to endure. But secondly, going to BlizzCon in 2019, which is probably going to be the last time I ever get to go to one, if they even have one again, ever Mm. uh, the way things are going kind of becomes this watershed moment where I'm really glad I went for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is because 
that Diablo four announcement went off like a bomb. Like oh, yeah. I don't think anybody who wasn't who wasn't actually physically present understands that that crowd of of like tens of thousands of people shut up. And that doesn't happen in a big crowd. There's always some sound, somebody whispering, somebody moving. Yeah, some you know, st- the whispering thing, like you don't realize like a crowd that size, even when they're quote unquote quiet, it it's a loud whisper. Like it's the entire area. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's like a... An, it's like a ululation almost. This is constant little bit of noise that's being made. And when the thing came up and that, that cinematic started playing, there was a moment of absolute silence. People shut up. And I remember it like, like it's that to me is one of the things about these games in general is you, you fail to understand until you've really been part of it for as long as we have is that consciousness of them. That the people, when 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 you come to that moment, they, I think the people of Blizzard are very keenly aware of this in a way that we're not. That everything they say, everything they do has reverberations. Like Liz pointed out, that comic announcement being just being for the same area as BlizzCon, like the same time, makes it, people will immediately jump on it. People will immediately say, oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And I've never forgotten that comic that never came out. <laughs> it never happened. We had, a, comic- we, had a, we had we had three whole episodes of podcast stuff that revolved around the idea of this <laughs> comic coming out on Lore Watch and here. Like- yeah. And the worst part is that everything we speculated on Lore Watch about it is, in fact, happening. Like, it, it is the plot of Diablo 4. Yeah. Because it, it couldn't not be. That was the thing. It was too important a subject for the game for it to not be what was going to happen. And so there's always been to my mind, there's an alternate universe out there in my head where they made the Diablo four announcement on, in 2018. Yeah. And I, I always wonder what was that BlizzCon like? What was the reaction to that? I don't think people would have even noticed Diablo immortal at that point. Yeah. like, um, And that's the other thing too. Like I, I, I agree with you. Like, and I've thought about this a lot too. If they had announced Diablo immortal and like, I remember like watching like Twitter explode, with this can't be the only Diablo thing they're announcing and waiting. Like, I honestly think had they announced like Diablo four, it would have completely overshadowed Diablo immortal and people would have forgotten completely about it. And yeah, now and it's, maybe, it's, it's a game I want to play now. Right. Like, yeah. In a, in a weird way, it might've been really bad for Diablo immortal. Had it, had they even done like a little panel saying and coming soon Diablo four and then and, nothing else. And I think they knew that too. Yeah, I think that they were. It's it's really an example of how this stuff it 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 has impact. You can't necessarily see from you know the seats outside of it, and it's really fascinating to look back and say, "Oh wow!" And that to me is one of the most Diablo things I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Is that that moment when when that that one little announcement of a comic book that and and I was by far not the only person to write a post about it or pick up on. It. I think Bliss Planet was all over it. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, it is just. It is something I still think about. And that way, since this email was that open-ended, that's your Diablo story. Because <laughs> we do have to do other things. Yep, we could. I think, uh, Liz, though, you're up for the next one. Uh, okay. A uh, question from Adele. Okay, another try this time, unfortunately, without a picture of Ash Kandi that dropped last week after many, many years of baddest of luck, frustration, giving up, trying again, and giving up again. But now my warrior has Ash Kandi transmog, and I'm feeling fine. Uh, I know Adele was talking on um, Discord the other day about having trouble uploading his Ash Kandi photo, so apologies, but we can enjoy the joy of Ash Kandi in our hearts. Uh, now, the rest of the question. <laughs> Greetings, O podcasters. Right. Due to time. Huh? No, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was not meant for you. <laughs> <laughs> that was me just accidentally almost choking on my, my drink. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, don't don't choke on your drink. Bad, <laughs> bad, bad for your health. Greetings, O podcasters. Due to time limitations, I haven't been able to play much mini alts. I've been mostly focusing on my Night Fae main. A couple of weeks ago, I maxed out my Warrior, and now I'm going through the Kyrian campaign. My knowledge of Vinthyr and Necrolord campaigns is pretty vague. Another thing is Rivendress storyline. I've really played through it only once, and then I kind of hyper-focused on Sire Denathrius's Bond villain performance. And the Naru thing somehow escaped my attention. 
So the question is, what's the deal with the Nauru and Rivendreth? What, what is it that they did? Why and how did they get there? Is it something leading into a possible next expansion? Help me out here. So you know that wonderful area in uh, Revendreth that's completely scoured by the light and is used as a way for Denathrius to sort of torture his most uh, fervent uh, opposers? That happened because the Naru waged war on Sire Denathrius, and I don't think we actually know why. <laughs> Did, haven't we found out in a recent... I thought it was in the Covenant campaign recently, the 9.1 campaign, that this was related to Sire Denathrius creating Dreadlords. Was it in the react in, in retaliation for creating Dreadlords? I, I thought, are, are the Dreadlords doing something? I thought it was related to the whole Dreadlord thing. The Naru came down hard and fire, fire everywhere. So I, I don't know if they specifically made the link. I think it's heavily implied because yeah, it's the, maybe the Tower of the Unseen Guest or whatever it is. That's where like a lot of this stuff like started happening. Um, but I think it or it might have been in a response to the Dreadlords trying to infiltrate and getting caught. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what it was, because that's also heavily implied that it was a reaction to whatever the long term plan for infiltration was. Um, so, yeah. So I think it was I think it was the spies more than creating dreadlords. But and then the light decided to go, hey, you know what? We're the light. We can burn things. We can travel dimensionally because the light touches everything. Why not go here and start a war? And so they did. And so the the one that's there is actually one that was was downed in battle and then taken into. Um, why can't I think of the dungeon now? The dungeon name. Oh, please help I me out know. here. Is it one of the Revendreth dungeons? Yeah, it's one of the Revendreth dungeons. It's not It's not Atonement, it's the other one. Well, thank you for driving it out of my head. Sanguine Depths. Thank you, Molly. Uh, but Sanguine Depths is the prison. And so, like, it's in there. It's being tortured and being manipulated so that they can learn how to use the light as a weapon. And, like, that's sort of the whole shtick. And then the light, when we finally free the Naru, won't take the Naru back. So the Naru sticks behind. And just like, yeah, I can't go back, so I'm going to stick here and punish Denathrius because, well, it's what we were going to do originally. Why not? But it's it's interesting, and it might actually be setting something up for the future, which is really, really cool because Matt and I talk about this on Lore Watch a lot. Like, we still don't know what's up with the Naru. Like, we have bits and pieces, but, like, they all seem very individually motivated. They all seem to have their own individual agendas to a certain extent. And to have them mobilized to wage war at that, that scale when... Even, like, looking at the Army of Light, that was one Naru, really. Maybe a couple. But, like, it wasn't as, like, a solidified force. So what does that mean? What does it even look like? Are we going to get to go back and see, like, them waging war on Revendreth? And then, technically, Revendreth won. So what does that say? Oh, what do you guys think? I definitely think it's interesting that they've they've brought in the uh, Dreadlords as this kind of... Shadowlands espionage agency that was infiltrating other forces that ha bears a great deal of responsibility for Sargeras's fall, ultimately. Oh, yeah. And that whole thing. Uh, because remember, in the current lore, that was the uh, it was the Nathrazim that uh, did that. I also think void, it's interesting. The void, the void the, tainted planet. Yeah. It also is interesting to me that the Nathrazim are still counted as demons in the game. So that that's that's interesting. That's fascinating to me. I, I I don't know where it's going, but I definitely think that this is something we'll see in a future expansion. I hope the next expansion isn't immediately jumping into more cosmic stuff, though. I feel like it, the next WoW expansion needs to take like I don't want to say slow down, but shift gears a little bit here. We've been like from from like Warlords on. We've been like going from like emergency to even bigger emergency to wide wide scale war to this i think we need at least one expansion of i don't want to say smaller stories but but stories that aren't so much you know everything we know is going to be destroyed I, i've had enough of everything we need we know is going to be destroyed i need one expansion of just you know a threat and we deal with it but also look at this cool new thing mm -hmm. I, I i don't know I don't know how Liz feels about it, so I'm going to throw that to her, what she'd like to see for the next expansion. But for me, I would definitely like to see something we've been calling the boat trip expansion for yes. years now, just some place where we, we get to <laughs> just explore and not necessarily destroy everything around us. What a crazy idea. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned saying not necessarily telling smaller stories, but what I would say, I think Blizzard tells small stories better than they tell big stories sometimes. 
because these big stories, especially stretched off over the game's, you know, 16 year history at this point, you have to keep getting bigger. Everything has to be bigger than the last one. It has to be bigger and more threatening and more ominous. And you keep going through this kind of scaling up, scaling up, and you kind of stop feeling anything because it's like, oh yeah, this expansion, we're going to kill a bigger bad. And oh, there's an old god, obviously. You know, you kind of stop having, you know, a real enthusiasm for like these major story events. But at the same time, Blizzard has gotten better and better at telling stories. But a lot of the times I think it's the small stories and the bigger expansion that are the most touching. And uh, if Blizzard did an expansion focusing on these small stories, like I've, I think my favorite cinematic in all of World of Warcraft is um, the one with Talanji and Rastakhan in the Battle of Jazara Lore Raid, because that's just, it's Talanji coming in right after the Alliance has stormed through the city and killed her father and he's laying there dying and it's just it's beautifully acted it's beautifully shot and it's just you feel for talanji and this is a beautiful little story and it's such a tiny tiny part of battle for azura Mm -hmm. but it's just like this beautiful little gem of a story that didn't get expanded upon on very much you don't get to see kind of the emotional fallout that happened there you just see oh talanji's gonna burn these people to the ground because they killed her father. And uh, an expansion that went small and focused on, you know, personal stories, personal tragedies or personal heroism, I think that could be a really good expansion. I don't know where we would go in this expansion or what we would do, but Blizzard is very good at telling stories and I think they're better when they aren't forced to do this big overarching we're gonna fight the biggest thing in the universe or else it's going to kill us all stories you know Sometimes. what could they do if they didn't have to get into that framework the way that the way that i i often refer to it as sometimes you want to read wheel of time sometimes you just want a collection of anthologies and hmm. we haven't had an anthology in a while honestly no. i think that one of the things that really sets apart original world of warcraft from any of its expansions is that by its very nature original world of warcraft was chapter based yeah and there was no overarching one threat that was everywhere and all the time. Uh, you went from fight to fight. You went from, you know, like your first raids are Molten Core and Anixia. And Molten Core was after you spent a lot of time running a lot of dungeons to build up to it. And you finally went in and, and dealt with, with Ragnaros and Anixia. But that just led you to the next thing, which was Nefarian. And then there was side stuff like ZG and the you know AQ20 that prepared you to go do AQ40 it, it's it's really interesting to me to think about how you know and they were tied together to some degree there was there was interrelation between them like for instance the fact that the the legendary you made it for Naxxramas you had to go to AQ to get part of it but it wasn't like literally because they were all secretly working for Arthas the whole time it was just that the world is big and there's connections between various parts of it i think that's the way to go for for a, an a, an expansion that's less about a gigantic overarching threat, it would be okay. This thing is happening. I honestly feel like Mr. Pandaria kind of has some lessons to teach us here because Mr. Pandaria was the last time that yes, there was the Shah and they were a big threat, but it, you know it wasn't really about the Shah. It was actually yeah. about us the whole time. It was about us going to Pandaria, the stuff that happened in Pandaria. Is as much the Pandarian, you know, the the the, the Pandarian's fault. I, I keep saying Pandarian instead of Pandarin, but I literally mean the people of Pandaria. I don't just mean the the race you can play. I mean everybody, the Jinyu, the Hosin, the 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 whole place was set up so that it was in in stasis. It could never go anywhere. It was never going to change. It was always going to be the same. It was going to always be at the mercy of these things. The Shah were always ultimately in charge of what was going to happen there. In a real way, for all the destruction we brought to Pandaria, it was necessary destruction because it had to end. The 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 last emperor, Shao Hao, he made a deal that froze Pandaria forever in this stasis. People lived, people died, but nothing was ever going to change there. And that's not life. Life mm-hmm. without change is just stagnation. So in a real way. Miss of Pandaria is a story that has a big ultimate threat, but that threat isn't really 
what you're fighting. It's you're you're fighting what you brought there, but you're also fighting the the mistakes of the past. There's just a lot to it. Garage Hellscream is the last boss you fight, but he's not the problem. He's just a symptom of the problem. Mm -hmm. He's actually in a real way. He's the objective correlative of the problem because he won't let the horde change. In yeah. fact, he goes back. He is a, a callback to an older version of the horde that is racist and won't move forward. And he won't let it move forward. He won't let it change. He won't let the old ways die. Old ways that he only knows from his childhood, you know? And it's really fascinating to see the character of Grosh Hellscream in Shadowlands screaming, you know, I do it all again. Of course you'd do it all again because you've learned nothing because you refuse to learn. Because in order to grow, you have to accept, maybe I was wrong. And that's something that Shadowlands actually does really well. Unfortunately, it's very hard to see. Because it's not, you know, the big overarching plot of what is the Jailer doing, what is Sylvanas doing, kind of gets in the way. Yeah. You talk about the small stories, and there are a lot of them in Shadowlands that are actually really good. Like the the Clea and, oh, bloody heck, I can't remember his name. Pelagos? Yeah. Pelagos. Yeah. yeah, the Clea and Pelagos stuff is really good. Like, it's really interesting to see them interact. A lot of the Night Fae stuff with the Winter Queen. The Winter Queen is a fascinating character. Mm -hmm. Where just enough emotion and just enough concern to make her under to make her likable without rendering the alienness of her gone. And unfortunately it's eclipsed by this overarching story of the big bad and what the big band bad's doing. Sometimes I feel like that'd be the best expansion one that didn't do that, but we have been talking a while and I feel like we've probably gone as far as we can. I will say um, that maybe the storyline in Shadowlands that I've enjoyed a heck of a lot more than the chase for Sylvanas and the Jailer is the Kyrian story where you go in and you're like, okay, this is a creepy cult and they're erasing your memories. So you follow their creepy cult ways and you go in and that's the state of things. And as you progress through the story, you see people in the covenant being like, maybe we've made some mistakes, like one or two. <laughs> And you get to the 9-1 campaign and they're like, okay, this is not working out. We're going to change and we're going to say, okay, you can have a choice. You want to keep your memories, keep your memories. If you want to leave your past life behind, you leave it behind. And so you see them growing and changing and learning, which you don't see a lot. Yeah, they, they break out of stasis. Yeah, yeah. It's, again, it's that idea of stasis versus growth. You can't grow if you don't recognize what you're growing from mm -hmm. yeah that's actually a really good example so yeah you're right i, I just i think you're I, right you are also right yay we're both right Teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah at this point i am gonna say we've been going a while and unfortunately these two questions that have not gotten answered in three weeks are not getting answered this week either i'm really sorry uh i i, I intended to, to get to them but you know sorry uh but blizzard watch it's uh I'm doing Joe's bit. Joe, it's your <laughs> thing. <laughs> this is the second time you've done that. Uh, Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means this podcast site and community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, a better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads-free site experience. And again, as a reminder, all of us at Blizzard Watch do stand with the employees of Activision Blizzard in demanding change for a better tomorrow and a safer work environment. Yeah, I think this is I, I'm here every week, so I hear you say it every week. <laughs> and so it's like it's in my head as part of the end script of the, you, of the you show. Mean, you mean like, like when we had Anne guest on Lore Watch for our 200th yeah. episode and she had to mute herself to keep from doing it because she did it so yeah. many times? Yeah, uh huh, exactly. Uh, I will say, though, that, yeah, I it's kind of a really interesting thing to, f to realize how much we do this show and the other shows that we do here and how, how much we like doing them. So yeah, that, that Patreon would be really helpful guys. It, it would help us do more stuff, but yeah, um, I'm going to do the final thought and then we're going to move on to my exit thing. Since we talked about expansions and what the next expansion might be and how it could be led to and so forth, I'm going to just throw this one out there straight up. You're given the option to do a blizzard expansion. Do you go back to something that exists in the lore and flesh it out and expand it? 
or do you do something entirely new that no one's ever heard of before? Joe. Entirely new. Uh, it's one of those things where like, as much as I love the deep and convoluted story that is the wow history and the deep lore, uh, and consulting the tomes and ancient knowledge and scrolls that we have gathered over the years, uh, while that's fine and dandy, having something that feels new and having that sense of exploration is always something that I'm going to be keen to. Uh, it's one of those things where, and I talk about this a lot, like when, when wow first dropped, when vanilla wow was first a thing. It was new, it was familiar, but everything we were exploring, everything we were experiencing was new and exploring like Titan stuff and and getting all these like little tiny stories from all these different zones and and learning more about the world. It was like this big sense of discovery. And then we had that again with Pandaria, even though it was familiar and had like some history behind it, it wasn't omnipresent and it was something somewhat new and it was still a sense of exploration. Even Shadowlands is scratching that itch right a little bit for me it's not perfect um and it is still tied in with like a lot of the deep lore and a lot of the long running stories but all those zones everything else it's new we're discovering new things so if given the choice i would try to come up with something new or bring something new that maybe isn't completely out of left field uh maybe ties or touches on something tangentially with the other areas but we got a whole big planet, folks. There's plenty of room for new things, new continents, new societies, races, kingdoms, whatever you want to put out there that could be fascinating and interesting and could have tons of those small stories and those important stories as you know, we learn about them. And that's something that I would do given the opportunity. Liz? Well, I mean, this is a good one because I actually have a different opinion than Joe. I think I've been wanting for so long to do an expansion where maybe instead of moving forward in this ever escalating storyline, we go backwards and look at some of the things that we have done and fix them or see how they've progressed. We've talked already about, uh, you know, how progressing the story and seeing how things change uh, really makes the story instead of seeing these worlds that are static and unchanging. I would love to go back to Pandaria and see what's happened since we've left. Can we fix some of the things that we screwed up? Can we, I mean, we did kind of go back at the end of Battle for Azeroth when Nazoth invaded and tore the place up even more. Um, but we have left such a wake of destruction behind us and inherently by the game, you get a new expansion, you go somewhere new and exciting. But we've left just this trail of devastation, fire, salted earth behind us as we have progressed. Why not go back, see what's happened at these places, fix things that we have broken before, and focus on the stories of these people and characters we know and that we've played with in the past, and where are they now? How can we help them today? Because just because we've defeated the Shah in Pandaria doesn't mean necessarily that the world has stopped and has frozen in amber. Stuff has happened there since we've been there. What's happening? How can we help? Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd really like to do like a fix-it expansion where we repair some of the things we've broken. So what I'm hearing is that Joe wants to do some kind of cosmic exploration of some sort, even if it's a small cosmos, and you'd like to do like a home fixer upper show, but with Azeroth. Yeah. Both I'm two there. ideas. I'm there. I was gonna say the two don't have to be mutually exclusive. I'm just saying. <laughs> but my my answer is actually um that I want to go to the Dragon Isles. Oh yeah. So that's my answer. Dragon Isles. I, uh, I do new. love dragons. They're new, but they're also old. I, I, yeah, Dragon Isles. But that's me. Uh this has been the Blizzard Watch Podcast. Uh, thanks for being here with me, Joe, and Liz. Uh, we like doing this show, and we're really glad you give us the opportunity. We're going to be back next week, so we hope you come see us. 